I've had a picture of a Confederate monument in my workspace for maybe 15, 20 years now. It's the Confederate monument on the Oxford Square in Mississippi. And it's because I'm a William Faulkner fan. That statue, that downtown, plays heavily in all of Faulkner's work. He fictionalizes Oxford as Jefferson, Mississippi. And so the first time I walked into Oxford, Mississippi, and you go to that downtown and there's the courthouse and there's the Confederate monument. It's like walking into Faulkner's work. And so when I see that Confederate monument in Oxford, I think of William Faulkner. I think of the literature that was created there. Now, when you look at the inscription around there, it says something like they died for a just and holy cause, they were patriots, things that I think are incredibly debatable. But I think about that because Faulkner uses that statue and he uses the Confederacy as this thing that has been lost. When we think about why they're up and what they mean to people, like if that monument was taken down in Oxford, Mississippi, I would feel like you're pulling something important about Faulkner and his work and what he's saying about the South out of reality. You know, you can't go and visit that. Monuments or memorials to the dead are ideas that begin to percolate almost as soon as the fighting stops because the country had just gone through this just awful conflict and so the first thing that people really north and south begin to try to reckon with and deal with is this issue of death. The first memorials and monuments that you see are to the dead of both sides. For example, that's how you see national cemeteries created, whether they're Gettysburg or Vicksburg or Shiloh. You have the cemetery here at Carnton where Confederate dead are buried. So the initial moves are to create these very appropriate, very moving, often beautiful places where the dead were buried. I think a monument to your dead is perfectly acceptable. And these are young men who marched away from small towns all around the America, all around the South. Many of them didn't come home. And there's a massive loss to families, to communities. Many of them are buried in unknown graves. I don't see anything wrong with a town, especially people who knew those folks, wanting to memorialize them and have a place to go and think about them and to remember them and to, to think about their loss. There begins to be a shift and in the 1870s, you start to see a move where other monuments begin to emerge. Those monuments, particularly in the South, are a kind of a mix between some individuals, particularly Robert E. Lee, some Jefferson Davis, but memorials begin to be considered for the common rank and file soldiers. One of the things that drew me to Franklin is this sense of a small town area. It reminded me of where I grew up. There is something that gets sold about southern towns, their quaintness, their charm, and there is no doubt that in a place like Franklin and in countless other towns around the South, at the heart of that is often a Confederate monument. And when we consider Confederate monuments, I think in 2021 and into the future, we have to think about their role in establishing the attitude and the feel of a city and what that means. And I think sometimes pulling them down quickly, while that's maybe not a bad thing, we don't fully reconcile with the past and the history and what it means. I think there's a kind of reckoning that still has to happen because those monuments have been allowed to exist and have been tacitly accepted for decades. You know, when Hewitt was talking down there, when the USCT dedication, and he talked about how Franklin, downtown Franklin never had anything for him, did not feel like his place. And that really is stunning because I know a different downtown Franklin. And I think when we talk about Confederate monuments, you have to remember what they have meant to different people out over time. At the core of the very argument or discussion about Confederate monuments is that they are not all the same. In a country where we promote the idea of individuality, Confederate monuments must all be treated exactly the same. That's how some people look at them. Personally, I've never looked at Confederate monuments as all being the same thing. First of all, they're not all the same monuments. They're all put up at different times. They're in different locations. They were installed by different groups. But what you do begin to see is a resistance to the creation and unveiling and dedication of Confederate monuments. This idea that somehow Confederate monuments were never controversial, well, that's just patently false. I think I would argue that for the black Black community in many areas, a Confederate monument, even if it wasn't controversial, there were no great warm and fuzzies about it. In the South, monuments were allowed to exist because if you lived in a small town in the South, of course you didn't question it. And you see a place like Franklin, you've seen it in Charlottesville, other cities around the South where the tenor of the city is changing. 2021 is we're moving into a new future and people are starting to ask how do they want to be defined? And people are now living in Franklin who have no reverence for the Confederacy, who have no desire to look back and be tethered to that ideology. And I think a lot of towns are reconciling what does it mean to have something that's at the heart of your place, the heart of where you gather. The there in Franklin is that circle. The, that's where the festivals are. That is the heart of downtown. 
What does it mean to have a Confederate statue in the heart of that downtown? And I think people are starting to ask those questions. Men from all around the South are all of a sudden wrapped up in this and fighting. I think that it's worth thinking about their sacrifice and their loss. And people may disagree with this, but I think about those young men dying to help us address the inequality that was baked into our founding. And that we had to, at some point, decide whether we were going to be a country that allowed slavery or we're gonna be a country that pushed for equality and freedom. And that when we came up to this intractable question, when we debated it down to its essence, the political solution resulted in a war. And that these men were wrapped up in it. They were caught in it. The difference is, those were people who maybe weren't driving the conversation. I think it's appropriate to remember that that young man was wrapped up in something much bigger than himself and something that we've been dealing with all over you know, 245 years now. But when we have these statues to the generals, to the leaders, there's a different type of reverence that happens in them. The people who look at them seem to venerate them in a different way. When national parks began to be created, the initial resistance to monuments to Confederate leaders in particular was former United States soldiers. The Grand Army of the Republic, known as the GAR, is adamantly opposed to monuments to Jefferson Davis, to Robert E. Lee, to Nathan Bedford Forrest. If you travel the national park system, there's a reason you don't see any Lee statues except at Gettysburg, and even that one was hotly contested. Gettysburg was opened as a park in the 1890s. That Lee statue takes 20 more years before the GAR finally relented. And I would argue it was because many of the veterans had begun to die, and by that time the country was engaged in World War I, and there was a continued reunification. But I'll admit, years and years ago, I never thought much of these monuments but I also didn't revere them. You know, I didn't look at them as something that were absolutely a required part of the public square or a national park setting. You start to have statues that show up in places that those folks never really were, where things didn't really happen. You know, the Charlottesville statues, right? I'm not sure that Robert E. Lee ever set foot in Charlottesville. Those statues are in places where there's no connection to any kind of combat, there's no connection to the people who are fighting, and, and those start to say something, I think, far different. The reverence of Nathan Bedford Forrest through art, through whether it's limestone or bronze, is a very unique and incredibly contorted story. When Nathan Bedford Forrest died in 1877, he was buried of, in all places, a cemetery. As a human being, that's where he chose to be buried, and that's where he was for almost three decades. When his wife passed away, she was buried next to him, Elmwood Cemetery in Memphis. I do not understand how anyone thought it was a good idea to dig up their bodies, but that is what they did. Forrest couldn't speak for himself, so he becomes like a tool of propagandists to dig him up, to rebury he and his wife in Memphis, which was one of the few cities in the post-war South that had upward black mobility. That's a symbolic move. And to put this, and it is a beautiful equestrian monument, to put it over the forest graves. That sent a signal and a message, not just to the black community, but to the white community that he was a hero. It serves a dual purpose, and it begins to build the forest aura even higher and greater toward immortality. Today, I think it has to be fair to admit that the sons of Confederate veterans, after the debacle that unfolded in Memphis, I think did a, a very good job in reclaiming not just the bodies, but the statue, to put it in a place where Finally, once and for all, they can rest in peace, and the statue can be in a place where it can be put into whatever context they'd like to put it into. One of the things we're talking about is memory. How these things are remembered into the future. How they affect us today. Those memorials, these historic sites, these monuments, are a part of the story that gets told. We should ask questions about what stories we want to tell. And I think that there are times that we need to tell them differently. If we think they're inaccurate, we think they no longer reflect the truth, they're no longer helpful, stop telling them. Change the lexicon. And to me, that's something that is, is worth considering about memorials. I don't know the answer on all of memorials. They're not all the same. They don't all represent the same things. But I think a lot about when we saw James Meredith over in Murfreesboro. James Meredith was the first black student admitted at University of Mississippi. He talks a lot about not needing an apology about what happened to him. He says what we need to do is start doing the right thing. Just start today doing the right thing. And I do think with Confederate monuments, the way we memorialize the Confederacy, the way they exist, the, those monuments exist in public spaces, it is important for us individually and collectively to start asking what is the right thing to do. And there may not be an easy answer to that, but we have to honestly grapple with it.